Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. So this is Podman 5 and Long-Term Software Maintenance, and my name is Matt Eon. I'm the team lead for the Red Hat Containers team. And let's go ahead and get started with a brief introduction to what is Podman. I'm hoping everyone in the room knows, but just in case you don't, uh, here is a brief summary. We are an open source container engine. We are open source, OCI compliant, daemonless, secure, and most important and most recently, multi-platform. And a bit of a timeline on our development. Uh, Podman 1.0 released in 2019. We developed for about a year before that, so say we start around late 2017. Podman 4.0 before 5.0 was released in 2022. So we just did a Podman 5.0 quite recently, and let's go a bit into why that really matters. Why does that 5.0 number matter? So since 1.0, we have used something called semantic versioning. It's a major dot minor dot patch version scheme. Basically, a major version bump indicates that we are doing something breaking. This is something that's going to cause users to not be able to do what they did before. A minor version bump is new features, patch version, we're just fixing bugs. However, uh, Podman 5.0, Podman 4.0, big releases like that tend to attract attention. You get people writing articles about you. And because of that, you really don't want it to just be a breaking change release. You don't want to just do things that break people. Every time we have done a major release, we have tried to include some sort of big feature alongside it, something that's a real headliner. So it's a marketing event in addition to just being a, uh, what do you call it, a technical event. So let's go into why do we decide to do major versions? Why did we recently do a Podman 5? Our last major version before this, Podman 4, was a February 2022 release. We began considering a Podman 5 in fall. Our target was somewhere again around February. And why do we start considering this? Uh, one, something called Podman Machine. This is our new code that allows us to run on multiple platforms. Podman Machine runs a Linux virtual machine on Mac, on Linux, well, we don't do a Linux virtual machine on Linux, but anyways, we do a Linux virtual machine on Mac and Windows, and we just natively interface with, uh, what do you call it on Linux? Anyways, uh, Podman Machine has some serious tech debt problems. Uh, Podman Machine started being written around the 4.0 timeline. We made a lot of poor assumptions, which we'll go into later, but suffice to say, it needed an almost ground-up rewrite. Uh, number two. We had some serious tech debt in our configuration files. We have a single config file called containers.conf, which we use to store configuration for basically everything containers related. It does Podman, Builda, Scopio, all that nice fun stuff. Unfortunately, we made some poor decisions there as well. We need to make some breaking changes to fix those. Next. Uh, we knew that there were some potential future RHEL releases coming around. I don't know when RHEL 10 is coming. I am very careful not to know, so I can't leak things. But at some point, there's going to be another RHEL in the future. It's time to start thinking about getting ready for it. And that means we're going to have to think about, do we want to deprecate anything in the future? Is there anything that we want to do to be ready for another long-term support release? And then, finally, we've got a bunch of other stuff. So during normal development on GitHub, anything that comes up that we think that's going to be a breaking change, you don't do a uh, Podman 5.0 because we are going to do a minor config change or a minor change to the output of, say, Podman Inspect. That gets tagged 5.0 on GitHub, and we leave it. And then when we're actually about to do a 5.0, you look at the stuff in the 5.0 column and you say, oh, there is a bunch of stuff here. That's a lot of things that we can put in. So there's all our breaking changes. And you might have heard me say earlier that we try to do features alongside this to be a marketing event. Well, we'll talk about that a bit later. So about why we are going to do a major version, you might have heard a theme there. A lot of tech debt. Every Podman major release from 1.0 up to 5.0 has been an opportunity for us to jettison some technical debt from the code base. 
Uh, Podman 2.0, for example, we did a major change to our config file format. We got rid of the old libpod.conf and introduced containers.conf. Podman 3.0, we got rid of the legacy Varlink API. So technical debt is not necessarily a bad thing. It means that we tried our best, but we made a bad decision in the past. We aren't deliberately trying to do bad, but a lot of these things are, we made a decision with the best information we had at the time, and it didn't turn out to be the right decision. And sometimes technical debt happens in user-facing places, happens in a way that we can't get rid of it without doing a breaking change. That's what major versions are for in our minds. We've tried to maintain a 12-month cadence in the early days, which is saying we aren't going to introduce these deliberate user-facing breaks that often, but we're still giving ourselves an, out an off valve. We're giving ourselves a chance to fix things. And yeah, we are increasing the cadence to 24 months in recognition of us theoretically having a mature project, but we'll see. So let's start going into what the tech debt is. Why do we need to make this breaking change? And, oh no, I thought I removed all the purple text. Oh well. Anyways, uh, Podman Machine is a multi backend virtual machine provider that works on three different operating systems. That's a little complicated. We made some interesting decisions in the early days of Podman Machine, that being we shared basically zero code between our original providers. Now this did make sense in the original world. We were doing WSL and QEMU on Mac. WSL on Windows and QEMU have very little in common because WSL doesn't <coughs> act like an ordinary virtualization provider. It doesn't really want to be an ordinary virtualization provider. It doesn't provide things like resource limits. It doesn't really want to have a disk image even. It wants to be as close to native as you can be when running Linux on Windows. So we shared basically nothing between the QEMU and the WSL backends. But then we decide that we have to have a Hyper-V backend on Windows because not everyone can use WSL. It's very new, people are scared of it, especially in IT departments. And because of the way we structured things, there is no direct way to, uh, there was no direct way to intr introduce code sharing, basically. So our multi-provider approach where we shared nothing means that we now have three virtualization providers that share nothing. And now we're going to have to add a fourth provider because it turns out that QEMU on Mac is kind of bad. We'll go into that a little later, but let's just say that QEMU on Mac is a very suboptimal experience and we're going to have to replace it. And then finally, if we're doing all of this at the same time, we might as well try and get ahead of the curve in some other places. And that is sort of image mode for our images. So previously, we had some stock FCOS images and we had to wait until Podman was released and then basically two weeks later it gets into Fedora and then potentially two weeks after that it makes its way into an FCOS compose. We have a four week lead time before we can use new Podman in Podman Machine. So that is really suboptimal. So by taking control of our own destiny and maintaining our own OS images, we could deliver a... Basically, when we shipped Podman 5.0, we were able to have Podman 5.0 in the VMs day one. So that was a target. So, first major step. Uh, Scott. One quick question, Will. We see image mode, or you want to call it, help in the future? When you can get me a Fedora boot C image, we will be using it. Right now, we are not actually image mode, but Fedora, we're Fedora Core OS, and when there's a Fedora Core OS boot C, then we can use it. We're optimistic. And we still have a lot of the tech integrated. I'll go into it later, but we're actually using container files to build. Technically speaking, our use of container files predates rel image mode. Anyways, uh, so. I've already gone into why we have a bunch of different backends. We're going to have to do a extensive rewrite to introduce code sharing just for maintenance concerns. Uh, we have completely different config file formats on Windows and on Mac. Got to unify that. 
And we also would really like to sh introduce as much code sharing as possible. So this amounted to something like a 70% rewrite of machine by lines. Uh, this is an extensive effort, and I would characterize it as the majority of the work that went into Podman 5.0. And it introduced a large number of improvements in code sharing. We actually have about as many lines of code as we did before, which is interesting to me. But before, I would say we had 30% sharing. Now we're up in the 75 to 80%. So we still have some per provider files, but a lot less which is a market improvement. We're trying to introduce some sort of sanity here if we have to support Podman on Windows and Podman on Mac at the same time, might as well not be supporting two entirely separate code bases. Now we'll talk a bit more about Mac OS in depth. Mac OS, we originally started off with the QEMU provider. QEMU had some pretty serious problems. Uh, one, file sharing. If we wanted to share a file from the native Mac machine into the, into the virtual machine, which is really why you want to use Podman machine, it's so you can interact with containers while still pretending that you're on native Mac. And if you can't use files from your native Mac, there's not much point to that. The only way to do that on QEMU is 9P, which is very old protocol-wise and very slow. Uh, also, there are some stability problems. QEMU updates on a semi-frequent basis and it seems to consider Mac as a second-class platform because testing there is minimal to non-existent and also the people in the homebrew community tend to take these releases and put them out there without any testing of their own so yeah QEMU gets updated a lot the updates break us very suboptimal experience Fortunately, there is a solution and the solution is the native Apple hypervisor we call it Apple HV the Apple hypervisor is a native solution provided by Apple. It's not perfect, but it has very fast file sharing. It has fast emulation. If you're on a AMD or an ARM64 rather Mac and you want to build, build an AMD64 image very fast using Apple HV. So we decide that we have to support this. And at the same time, we do not want to support an additional backend. Uh, if we're doing a Podman 5.0 already, if we have a license to make breaking changes, get rid of QEMU entirely. The back end doesn't make sense in our opinion. Let's switch over entirely to Apple HV. And unfortunately, though, we did have to add a further back end. Uh, Apple HV has no way to share GPUs into the container. I'm sure you've seen enough AI talks at this conference that you know that that's kind of a break, kind of a deal breaker. So now we also support something called libkrun, which is Red Hat developed and has a lot of the nice features that Apple HV does. A little worse integration with the operating system, but it also lets you mount VM or mount GPUs into your containers. So that's nice. Next. Custom images. Scott was getting into this a bit, but basically, we really needed the ability to cut our own VM images. We were previously using stock FCOS. As I said, there is a month delay potentially between us cutting Podman to it getting into the VM images. That is very suboptimal. Uh, the Podman desktop team, especially. Uh, if you've used Podman desktop, we love them, but they were very annoyed that we could not get them a working uh, BM image with Podman in it for a literal month. So, in addition to that, we're doing a V4 to V5 release. That's a breaking change release. Who's to say that the API is going to be completely compatible? As a matter of fact, it's not completely compatible. When we come out with Podman 5, we have to have a Podman 5 in that machine image so that day one things work and you aren't waiting four weeks with a completely non-functional machine. So, Right now, we have implemented something that's sort of a partial version of image mode. Uh, we build off container files. We have a image that is distributed as an OCI artifact. It's available on Quay. You can look it up, Podman Machine OS. However, it's not based on Boot C. We don't have a Fedora Boot C image yet. Uh, once we have one of those, should be switching over. And this is 
a massive improvement for us just in terms of process. It's a bit more effort on our side because previously we weren't maintaining VM images and now we are, but the effect for users is just incredible. We have day one ability to use the latest Podman. Now, I've talked a lot about changes we're making. We've completely rewritten the configuration files or the, changed the format of the config files. We've completely removed the QEMU backend on Mac. Uh, how are we going to migrate users? And here's where the breaking change release comes in. We're not. We always say that containers are supposed to be cattle, not pets. You're not supposed to have things in your containers that are irreplaceable. You're supposed to be able to easily recreate. And we recognize how much it sucks to have us say your existing virtual machine is no longer usable, but there was no other way in our eyes. Uh, we were dealing with so much tech debt in that old code base, the assumptions we'd made were of a sufficiently bad quality that we had to make a clean break. The new config file format is also versioned. We're not going to have to do this in the future. We have a sane way of dealing with this. And hopefully, V5 is the only time we're going to have to tell you you have to delete your VM and recreate it. But that is what we had to do. And this is just a quick demo of what Podman on Mac looks like now. So here's a Podman V4. And let's just do a quick uh, machine list. And we've got a machine that's up. So here is one that I actually forgot to mention. We greatly improved the start time on Podman versus uh, V4. So V4 with QEMU, we would expect start times of almost a minute for the virtual machine. You can see in the future or later in this demo how fast it is now, but it is, there we go. Finally up, 43.237 seconds. This, it, when you're trying to get a virtual machine up to do anything, that is not a good thing. Now, fortunately, you don't have to boot it but once per uh, reboot, unless you care about battery life, because these things do sap your battery. Now, let's go ahead and clear things out, and we're going to switch over to Podman 5.1, have our nice, wonderful Mac installer. And... Okay, so now we have a 5.1 binary. Just doing quick Podman version there. And reset is a new command in 5.1 that lets you get rid of all existing virtual machines. That's our solution for the 5 or 4.0 to 5.0 migration, unfortunately. So now we're going to create a virtual machine, and the first step of that is grabbing the image. And this yeah, you probably have seen that progress bar before. That's a standard container's image progress bar. We are using OCR artifact pull. And now that we have it, we do a Podman machine start. Still not as fast as we would like, but nine seconds is a lot better than 43. <coughs> and then, let's see. I think, oh, now we're going to look at the uh, manifest list for the machine images. And here is the full manifest. There are something like eight things in that manifest. Uh, we have images for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I believe AMD64 and ARM64 for all. And here is what the new config file looks like. So not really much relevant here other than it's nice JSON and I believe you can see it. Yeah, there is a version field in there now. So previous config format also JSON but not versions and this new one is not uh, operating system dependent. And of course, everything we have works on latest Apple Silicon, M2, M3. 
And thanks greatly to Ashley from my team, who could not be here today, but put this demo together for me. I am not a Mac person, so I cannot demo on Mac. And here's a quick test of Rosetta. This is the high-speed emulation on OS X. So this is another one of the big things for us, the ability to quickly deliver, uh, basically quickly deliver images on AMD64 despite being on an ARM64 Mac. This is one of the things that we really want to be able to do quickly because if you're deploying, if you're building on a Mac, you're not deploying on a Mac. So we've got to still be able to build for AMD64. So yes. Yes, uh, so it's very similar to QEMU user static if you've used that before, which is basically emulation for an architecture, but it is native. I don't want to say it's native. It's more native than QEMU user static. It is, I think it has some sort of instruction level support in the Apple CPUs, and it's relatively fast because of that. Nowhere near native performance still, but fast enough that you can build a simple image or compile something without having a serious performance hit. Alright. Yeah, it was definitely originally a compat thing. Oop. Uh, come on. Alright, uh, config file rework. So this is our second major item of tech debt. Uh, we did a bad thing. We treated our config file as a database. So we have a lovely config file, and then we introduced something called Podman Machine. And the config file had a way to list what we call connections. A connection is a way of saying Podman is going to connect to a remote server on a different system. This was originally implemented so you could have, say, the ability to talk to your cloud VM with Podman on your laptop. This predated Podman Machine, and when we implemented Podman Machine, we thought to ourselves, well, this is wonderful. We can use the existing connection mechanism to allow us to connect to the machine VM. Problem. The existing connection mechanism is in containers.conf. Containers.conf is supposed to be a user-writable config file. If we want to use it like this, we're going to have to rewrite it every time the user makes a VM, or deletes a connection, or any one of these numbers of things. Uh, this is really suboptimal. It reformats the config file, so any user formatting, any user comments are gone. It's not exactly a nice way of doing business. So, we wanted to, one, refactor out the bits that are built, written by Podman, and two, ideally, be backwards compatible while doing this. So, this was supposed to be a breaking change, but we wanted to give ourselves the margin to make it not a breaking change if we had time. And fortunately, it turns out that we did have time. We have a new config file that lives underneath Podman's own directory structure, so users don't have to see it. It contains the database of connections. And if you still have connections in your containers.conf, we're not going to rewrite it to remove them. You can remove them yourselves if you want to, but they still work. So. This one is something we thought was going to be a break, but was not. And then here's just the grab bag, the other stuff we got to do. Deprecations, removals, and default changes. Deprecation, cgroup v1. We want to remove cgroup v1 support entirely, but certain things that we have to support, uh, cough, WSL cough, unfortunately only support cgroup v1, so that wasn't possible. Now, instead of completely removing support, we just pop up an annoying warning message when you try to use it. Uh, there were a variety of options in Podman Machine from before the rewrite that just no longer made sense. We changed our handling of SSH keys as a, an example, and we had a bunch of options related to how SSH keys would be managed. Now the management is entirely automatic, so all those options are gone. Uh, CNI support is completely removed except on FreeBSD and RHEL 9. RHEL 9 because we can't make breaking changes in the middle of a RHEL cycle, FreeBSD because it's the only thing that works on FreeBSD. Uh, BoltDB. So Podman originally used a spec database called BoltDB, which was nice and simple and also had serious data corruption problems if you happen to press the restart button on your system at an inconvenient time. Uh, we switched over to SQLite somewhere in the Podman 4 cycle, I want to say around a year ago, and 
we are just gradually removing both DB support. Right now, we're not letting you create new databases. Eventually, we're going to stop supporting it entirely, probably with some sort of migration process. But basically, we're removing the old database that has data corruption issues. Please use SQLite. And finally, changes in defaults. We'll talk about pasta in detail in another slide. And then there is CLI option parsing. This one seems minor, but this is one of CodeWise, the largest ones. Uh, we probably put in the vicinity of 300 lines of diff stat in here. Basic summary, if you had a podman option that said podman run hyphen v, let's say, uh, you could specify multiple instances of hyphen v by comma separating. We have changed that so that's no longer possible. Now you have to do hyphen v volume 1 hyphen v volume 2. It's a very simple, it's a disturbingly simple change, but also kind of necessary. And here is one that we did not come up with ourselves. So this is really community driven. We have always said that the alias docker equals podman and it'll just work, but it has been 90%, I would say, for a while. We're getting better. But at this point, we also have to take into account Podman has its own community, and when we break things, people do notice. So if there's a minor incompatibility between Podman Inspect and Docker Inspect, uh, you can see one of those up there. One of those is a JSON array, the other one's just a string. So uh, yeah, when we make a change like that, we now are trying to wait for major versions. And again, this one is something that got brought up by the community. They looked at it this and they said, well, it would be nice if we were more compatible. They made the PR and we went ahead and merged it after some debate. Uh, Podman stats is another one. You can see on the bottom there that we have some pretty significant differences in how we handle networks. Uh, basically, if you had multiple network interfaces, it's handled very differently now. Anyways. Little changes like this we used to just fix on our own, but now more complicated since we have a large community. And now, features. So I would said before that every Podman release we try to have big headlining features and then we have some breaking changes on the side. This was our Snow, Le Snow Leopard release. If you're familiar with OSX Snow Leopard, it was a release where they just broke stuff and they didn't actually add features. We had so much that we had committed to and we had effectively three months to make our deadline, which was the deadline for Fedora 40. Uh, we just did not have time to do anything other than this. Now, fortunately, the community did come to our rescue here. We had a bunch of new features added into Quadlet, for example, and we had a couple new features elsewhere, so it's not a completely feature-dead release. Thank you, everyone who's contributed to Podman. You are our saviors. But, yeah. This was very much a, not a feature release, but a release that set the tone for the next 18 months, I'd say. This is necessary stuff to expand on Podman Machine further to support Podman Desktop better. Bit of aftermath. Uh, we released on March 19th. This is about a week after our optimal target, but still within deadline. And it was uh, landed in, Podman, in Fedora 40, supported on Podman Desktop since 1.10. And it broke some things, which we will discuss now. It's never the things that you expect. It's always the things you don't expect. So Pasta. Pasta is a new network stack for Rootless Podman. Rootless Podman needs to use a custom network stack, which basically acts as a manual tunnel. Because normal Podman, we have full root permissions, we can modif modify the firewall, we can add stuff like uh, NAT rules, can't do that on rootless. So we were previously using something called Slurp for NetNS. Slurp for NetNS is actively developed as part of the QEMU project, but it's also slow. It does a lot of things in a suboptimal manner. Pasta tries to do things better and faster. And on top of that, it has a very active maintainer who is very good about responding to feedback. Uh, we haven't had the best experience trying to get patches into Q or Slurp or NetNest before. So because of that, we decided to go ahead and make POS the default. It seemed like it was very sensible. And the first warning sign for us probably should have been that it took a month to get it passing CI to get it merged in, which 
not exactly optimal, but hey, it passed CI. We had confidence in it. It seemed like it was going to work. Unfortunately, uh, CI tests are not exhaustive of, user, of everything users do. We're keeping it in. It's a very responsive upstream. Stefano on their team is incredible, but it has caused probably the most problems of anything in Podman 5.0, and we are still fixing problems in, in the 5.1 and 5.2 releases. Okay, uh, so the future. Development never stops, and we are trying to move less fast. We did Podman 5.1 and 5.2, relatively small feature releases in May and then August, and then 5.3, presumably sometime in October, and we're hoping to return to the 24-month breaking change cadence with Podman 6. And we have our socials, and on to questions. Scott. With pasta, how's your confidence level now? I know CI is never perfect, but you've had some human time and some 911 calls and, you know, fire and police sent out and what, how you feel now? For a typical user, actually very confident. Uh, it's the people who are doing weird things or were relying on weird behavior in Slurp that are being affected. The unfortunate thing is that rootless networking is never perfect. Like, nothing does everything that a root networking stack does. So Slurp for NetNS has its specific set of trade-offs. Pasta has its specific set of trade-offs. We're working to make sure that the Pasta trade-offs overlap the Slurp trade-offs as much as possible, and it's just a better version of Slurp. But it's never going to be perfect. And two two following questions. And is it you said when you said faster? Did you? I wasn't quite. I couldn't quite grok if you meant release cadence faster or performance faster. Both actually. Okay, interesting. They are Stefano over there, incredible engineer, doing a lot of work. Uh, incredibly responsive, which is a large part of why we did it. And is that so, a redheader or external person? Uh, he's internal. Oh, okay, interesting. Okay. So yeah, basically, it, if we need something from him, he makes us a release. That's, that's awesome. And then with pasta, was it? What did he create it for? For the same reason as Slip for NetNS or something else? I think it was for the same reason. Slip for NetNS was originally for rootless QEMU VMs. We were just we hijacked it because it did the same things that we needed. Yeah. But yeah. Interesting. That's cool. Any other questions? No? I can ask more positive questions. <laughs> I do have one call for action. If anyone here has used Podman and has experienced our documentation and found it lacking, I know, I feel your pain, we're trying to fix it, but we need to know where. Anyone who has a bad Podman documentation story, who has experienced something in our docs that is lacking, please file an issue on our GitHub. I'm trying to get a list together so I can get people targeted on it, but I really need to know what we should fix. Knowing how issues normally work, when the issue is something along the lines of it sucks, that never gets addressed because you can't be that specific. But when the problem is I literally can't find a damn thing when I'm looking for it, like I don't know how to tell you any more specifically than that. Like most everything that I find when I use Podman is I find someone else who talks about how they solved the problem on Stack Overflow, not the documents. Honestly, if you could just tell us where you expect to find this, like I should we have a docs page on Podman IO? Should it be on the GitHub? Should we're all over the place right now. I feel like most of our documentation is in the form of blogs, which is not optimal. Anyways. Especially when it comes to things like uh, bot lists. Yes. The documentation for bot lists is two blog posts. It ex the man pages are good, but if you don't know they exist, you don't know to look at the man pages. And if you don't know to look at the man pages, yeah. So I would like to... Basically, what I'm trying to do is assemble a list of big topics that we should be covering the docs. I know we have to rewrite our network tutorial. Our basic tutorial is really out of date. A quadlicate tutorial would definitely be something I'd like to get done. 
but just ideas on things we can do to make life a bit easier. So I, it's not really a follow-up, but it, it, it's a tangent because I brought up quadlets. Um, we used to do Podman generate system D, and it would generate a cool file that we could just throw into system D and it would work. And I understand the reason we went to quadlets, and I love quadlets, but why isn't there a Podman generate quadlet? I keep telling them that they should do it. It's, there are reasons why it doesn't exist, technical reasons. I think we should be doing it anyways, despite those technical reasons. I mean, so, I, I hate to say it, but there's the Podlet tool out there where I can literally throw a Podman command at it, and it says, here's your Quadlet. And I feel like, okay, You're not I know wrong. there's probably some shortcomings to that that I haven't come across, but it seems like a good starting point. You're not wrong. Uh, this is, I would love a feature request on this just because it is, I can't promise immediate priority on it, but it is something I would love to get to because it's the last gap between quadlets and generate system D. It hasn't gone away, but we deprecated it because all, basically, uh, all the new development is going into quadlets. Uh, Especially since Valentin left the team, the the steam has gone out of Generate System D. The deprecation is basically a license for us to say we're not adding any more features. Uh, features go into Quadlet only. Generate System D wasn't maintained. Yes. Yeah, the core problems of Generate System D, like fixing the it fixed the unit file at a version in t at a point in time, but Podman's not static. System D is not static. The best unit file keeps evolving. Quadlet fixes that. The unit file is now generated every time it needs to be. <laughs> 